Yeah, and it has been a journey. Uh, it's actually uh, started on August 19th uh, when he was injured, and uh, you'll notice that tomorrow is November 19th, and so it's almost three months to the day uh, that he's being discharged home. And that's very typical for the course of a patient who has a burn as sizable as his with as many complex injuries as his. It's not just the size, but also many of his burns were very deep, he had a very prolonged intensive care unit stay, uh, and we actually were talking this morning and he said, when were my fingers amputated and why did they have to be amputated? And he doesn't remember that, but um, he was awake actually and we talked about it. And we talked about the need for his amputation, but there's a lot of things that the brain protects you against and one of them is um, some of the pain and the angst that you undergo when you're trying to recover from the acute phases of an injury such as Daniel's. He, as you saw in the press release, had uh, has had 11 surgeries, some of which are uh, aimed to remove the dead tissue, the burned tissue, some of which are aimed to uh, cover the tissue. We have to do that temporarily with some biological dressings initially, and ultimately it, the skin has to be covered with his own skin. And so some of those operations involve taking skin from some parts of his body that were not injured and transferred to uh, the areas that were and uh, as I said, he also had to have uh, an operation where he had the tips, the fingertips amputated because they were so deeply burned. I think that um, he's made a remarkable recovery, and in part that really is due to his parents' steadfast uh, commitment to be at his bedside and all of the people who supported him from the community. The, uh, the commitment that the people who, strangers, who sent letters to him, uh, I think that really buoyed him throughout his uh, hospital stay and uh, gave him a will to recover. We've talked about it a little bit. He, his journey's not over. He's got a hard row ahead of him. He has to, we know that he's going to deal with itching. We know that he's going to deal with scarring. You can see that the mask, you can see the mask that Daniel is wearing. That's one of the uh, non-operative uh, therapies we use to prevent scarring on the face or limit scarring on the face. This particular device is custom made. It involves taking a laser scan of his face and then creating a UVEX mask, which is lined with silicone. And he is supposed to wear that about 23 hours a day. And the idea is that it puts pressure on the scar and uh, prevents them from being coming quite as raised as they might be. It's contoured for his eyes and also for his lips and should put pressure on his lips so that uh, they maybe won't contract as much as uh, they would otherwise. He has other garments which are uh, made of an elastic material that are also customized and he wears those on his hands, his arms, and his legs. He, uh, as I said, can anticipate a long row ahead. We know that and you know for all the people who have supported him up till now I think he's going to have ongoing psychosocial needs. Uh, one of the uh, resources that he will be able to avail himself of if he chooses to is something that was developed by the National Phoenix Society and that we have a uh, uh, chapter here, which is known as supporters, uh, excuse me, survivors, SOAR, S O A R, survivors offering assistance in recovery. And these are burn survivors. And he's met with a few of them already uh, who have come to visit him to um, offer um, the opportunity to compare stories and to uh, 
give him a, an idea of what it's going to be like down the road. On August 19th, that was definitely the scariest day of my life. But, you know, I got to share that day with some really great firefighters. i never forget telling one of those guys that, uh, that if I had to go into any fire, it would be with him. And that last day, I got to share it with him. Um, those guys are the reason I'm, that I'm here today. For Andrew, Tom, and Rick, and their families, I don't want their legacies to stop here. Those guys were truly brothers to me, and we shared a lot of great moments together. And I'm also here to thank everyone for the support that I've got. I've gotten cards from around the world, and I mean hundreds of cards supporting me. Some that I know, some that I've never even met before. And that support has been truly the best therapy for me. You know, this accident was a true tragedy, but it's brought out so much good in the world. I've never seen so many gracious people in my life, and, and it's truly helped me through this entire process. And a lot of the people that I've, I've met um, are going to continue to help me. Um, you know, I don't want any of those guys to be forgotten, and I want the community in the world to, com to continue to support all of law enforcement and fire personnel out there. They're the people that put their lives on the lines every day and keep our community safe. And, um, and I'll be forever grateful to all of them for that. They truly feel like my brothers and sisters. If I could just follow up and just make a prevention uh, plug, because what Daniel had to face on August 19th might have been preventable. We were talking about this with his family earlier. One of our strong efforts of the Burn Center, Center is fire prevention. And certainly in the summer, we can anticipate that we're going to have a dry environment. And many of the Burn, the fires that uh, firefighters like Daniel have to uh, fight are unnecessary. They're due to campfires that have not been extinguished. They're due to fireworks that uh, have run amok. And these are human errors that are preventable. And it's wonderful that we have a committed fire f uh, safety uh, organization that uh, helps mitigate these accidents when they happen, but if we could avoid injuries such as the ones that happened to Daniel and his colleagues, that would certainly be uh, the better part of valor. I know his mother and I are just so thankful for, um, for Harborview itself, for all that they've done. Um, we're just glad that there is a burn center here in the, in the Northwest to, uh, to help people uh, uh, not just Daniel, but obviously um, a lot of people get burned. And thank you um, tremendously. Um, I'm sure his mother and I would say the same, echo what Daniel said, the, the community support and love and, um, and prayers, um, overwhelming, over, truly overwhelming. Oh, go ahead. Yes, thank you to everybody. You've been such great support for, to, to, to Daniel and in the prayers, and they've all worked, and, and uh, um, we're so proud of our son, and we're so proud of the hospital here. They, they are number one, and the staff there is just tremendous. No matter what they do, they do it great, and uh, um, you can tell the love of the people, um, it's there in their hearts, so thank you. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mrs. Murphy's class, also, for all the letters that you sent, and, and uh, um, and to all the schools, too, who have written to Daniel, and thank you. And without a doubt, Seattle Fire and Police made us feel at home and really took the extra steps to, uh, to uh, welcome us into their family. Thank you. And I'd also like to thank all the MTs from, from over in the Twisp area and the doctors here that essentially saved my life. I 
it's hard for me to believe myself that I'm here today. So um, I thank them all for that, and especially my parents who have been here every day for me to wake me up in the morning, and they tuck me in and fed at night, and uh, for grateful for that. And also for the Seattle Fire Department and all the fire departments from around the area, and, my, and the Milton Police Department for for sending their officers my way and supporting me in every way that they possibly could. I'm forever grateful. Thank you. You guys have some questions you want to ask? Daniel, can you tell us a little bit about just sort of how you're feeling physically? I mean, obviously, as Dr. Gibran mentioned, you have some special coverings on hands and legs and arms, and it looks like it's probably a little hard to move around after all the surgeries. Can you give us an idea, though, of just how you feel being able to walk out of here today? It felt great walking outside today. Feeling the fresh air was it's something you take for granted, but it felt amazing. Um, definitely feel stiff on a constant basis. Um, my skin always feels tight, but as far as uh, the pain management, I've had a really low level of pain, and uh, and luckily, um, you know. I haven't experienced a lot of pain yet, so I think that's you know due to the doctors and some of the medications that I'm taking and and you know again the support that I get, I've luckily had a low level of pain. What are you looking forward to doing at home? Um, I can't wait to you know get back home. I see my dog, be more active, um, and just to be able to be outside. I mean, one of the reasons I took this job was to have an outdoor job. Being outside is is truly where I feel at home. And so, uh, and you know, being a part of the U.S. Forest Service was was a dream come true for me. And uh, they allowed me a job where I could be outside all the time. So I can't wait to get back outside and be home for that reason. Daniel, when did you realize? What was it like realizing that you were going to survive? Um, being in the ICU for a long time, you know, I was I was very out of it. When I, um, I believe my 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 dad and a couple others said that I had asked um, if I was going to live, and they knew at that point I was going to live and survive this because I didn't ask if I was going to die, and uh, you know I think. Waking up and when I finally was able to get out of bed, I knew I was going to be able to make this. And yeah, that, that was the point. Do you remember one point in your stay here that you were able to do that? Uh, it, it wasn't that long out of ICU that um, with the help of my parents, I was able to start walking. And uh, I'm guessing that was a few weeks after being here. It was a long time after yeah, being here. Yeah. <laughs> you left the ICU in October. Okay. <laughs> so it was a while. <laughs> Daniel, what was it like, you're in so much physical pain, um, your recovery process is so hard, but also having to deal with the emotional pain of losing you know, your three friends and fellow firefighters? Yeah. Um, I, I've told many people through this whole journey that the mental part of this is tougher than anything. Um, a lot of support has been offered, and uh, and that's definitely helped me along the way. But you know, little things like smelling smoke from a burning toaster oven will will trigger memories of that day, and and hearing a smoke detector goes off, it sets you in panic. But um, yeah, the and and those guys are on my mind on a constant basis and it's something you can't get out of your mind it it's the pain of that is definitely way harder than any physical pain that you can imagine have you seen your dog since the I haven't and he's been in the in the uh, kennel since I've been here so um, you know the people from twist they uh, really helped out, and my dog is, you know, he's, you know, like a kid to me, 
And so uh, they really helped me out and they paid for his kennel stay and donated a lot of money to him. And I've also had, you know, people come in and they've brought me special gifts just for him because he means a lot to me. What's your name? Ozark. Can you talk about what life would be like now that you're out of the hospital? What would you need to do? What would you be able to do? You know, right now the, my hands are my biggest struggle. Um, I can't move them a whole lot. And so initially when I get out of here, not having my independence fully is going to be tough for me. Um, I've been on my own for a while and and not being able to go back to being fully independent will be the toughest part. But what's going to be essential is for me to be constantly active. The doctors have stressed that it's going to be a full-time job now, you know, plus overtime for me to be active and constantly moving my joints to battle that scar tissue that's building up 24-7. And, uh, you know, staying active is going to be essential to that. You're up for that, though. I am. You know, being active has is, is always been a part of my life. Going hunting with my dad and fishing with him and being going skiing and hiking and all of that is, is always what I've lived for. So I feel like being active won't be a problem for me. I know you can't jump into all of those activities immediately, but do you feel like all of those things are still in your future? Definitely. You know, I um, there's been a lot of support from the firefighting community, and I've met a lot of good friends, and uh, a couple of them live very close by, and they're going through a lot of tough stuff right now, too, medically. And we've teamed up together to, you know, help each other, go to therapies together, and go on hikes. You know, I can't climb mountains right now, but right now I can climb hills. <laughs> and and that's exactly what I plan to do and work my way up to it, so. So, will you go home? Where, where will you actually go? Will you go to your parents' house or in the Yolo program or? Y yeah, I don't want to answer that quite yet. I don't want to answer that quite yet. Oh, okay. Thank okay. you. Did you live in Twiz before? I was stationed in Stay. Winthrop okay. for the summer. Uh, Dr. Gibran talked about um, wildfire safety. Is that something that you think about a lot or want to talk about as well? Not like for fire safety, you know, campfires and fireworks and that kind of thing? Sure. Um, you know, being a firefighter, you when you get that call of going to the fire, it's a lot of excitement and you look forward to it. But you also know in the back of your mind that it's threatening the wildlife, it's threatening it's threatening homes and it's threatening people's lives. Um, people, I think, definitely need to be more careful. We do a lot of fire prevention signs, try to teach the community about fire prevention, but there's still always those accidents that happen. And sadly, sometimes they aren't even accidents. And, and people do need to take into consideration how important you know, Mother Nature is, and respect that. And fire prevention would ultimately save a lot of lives, a lot of homes, and a lot of our forests. And taking the extra step to make sure that campfire is put out, making sure you're extra careful with fireworks, making sure you are not just throwing your cigarette out the window is an important thing. In the long run, do you hope to go back to firefighting and some capacity? Uh, right before going into um, firefighting, I graduated police academy and uh, I'm a reserve officer for the Milton Police Department and that's essentially my goal is to go back into law enforcement and be a police officer or work for the Forest Service in the law enforcement end of it. Mr. and Mrs. Lyon, what has your son taught you over the past couple of months? Ooh. <laughs> a lot of patience. <laughs> um, Just, that's a you know, I guess we haven't even had a chance to reflect. That's that's the strange question. All we've at this point, I think, is just been thankful he's alive, and, and it really 
trying to get through each day, uh, waiting for this moment that he gets to go home. Um, um, like, um, um, they've said he's got a long uh, uh, row ahead of him, um, and we'll just be there to support him, but we're just looking forward to the day that, that he says, bye, Mom and Dad, I'm going to go do what I want to do. <laughs> not, not, not what you need to help me do. So that's, that's the goal that we're shooting for, and, and he's taught us that uh, anything's possible. Um, with hard work, anything's possible. That's true for everybody. speaking and, and it was not a sure thing that he was going to survive. Was there any approach to this that, you know, where he turned the corner or allowed him to turn the corner? Was there anything that you can pinpoint that was a really crucial piece of his survival? Being academics, we're always trying to evaluate what may have been different about every patient. And I have to say that um, one of the things that probably uh, saved him was that his lung injury wasn't as bad as it might have been. Many patients have devastating lung injuries. And he was on the ventilator for a little while, but he was able to get off the ventilator pretty time, in a pretty timely manner. And I think that's something that uh, might have increased his survival chance. Um, otherwise, his course was pretty standard for a patient who has had an injury as severe as his. I, I will say that many years ago we looked at our data to see of patients who had burns that were greater than 60% total body surface area and which ones survived. And it turns out that one of the factors was having a strong family support at your bedside. And one has to assume that maybe some sort of um, mindfulness or some sort of spirituality might also have uh, something to do with it. But aside from knowing that the larger the burn, the older the patient, and the presence of an inhalation injury are all risk factors for mortality, the fact that uh, you have a constant presence at your bedside to inspire you and to give you hope and to have voices that are friendly to you, I think is very important for patients. What's the best way for people to continue to support Daniel as, as life goes forward here? For a little while, give him some space so that he can actually enter the community by himself. We know that. Um, community reintegration for many of our patients can be very challenging. And otherwise, take the lead from Daniel and let him direct them. But don't forget about him. Uh, generally, patients get huge outpouring of support when they're first injured. But now that he's going home, he's going to continue to need that psychosocial support. But it needs to be meted out in uh, small increments so that he's not overwhelmed. He needs some time. Agreed. One last question, and I think we're going to let Daniel go. Meeting the host. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have a final question before we wrap up? What are you going to eat? Steak. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. You know, one final thing is the Forest Service has been a huge support to me. My liaison, Karina, has been an amazing part of our family and uh, has supported us in so many ways. And there's so many great people that make up that organization. And, uh, you know, I've met a lot of smoke jumpers, a lot of hand crew members, and they've all supported me in so many ways. And, you know, some are, are in the hospitals currently, you know, recovering from their injuries, and they still reach out to me to support me. And uh, I thank them for that every day, and they all know who they are. Mm -hmm. Thank you.